Hi, this is Ben Schwellen. Today I'm talking about the Etruscan people. Who were they? And what makes them special? Hey, hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel. Thanks. The Etruscans were an ancient people in present day Italy, before the Romans, and at the same time for much of their history. Let me show you where they were on a map. They're in present day Tuscany. Tuscany comes from the Roman name for them. And adjacent you get the Tyrrhenian Sea, which is the Greek name for the Etruscans. The Romans and the Greeks were interacting with them in different ways. And those two names carry forward from that time. There are place names scattered across Etruria, the land of the Etrurians. Today, which carry on names from that time, but they've been heavily Latinized, indistinguishable from the Latin words that gave Italian. But to the Etruscans themselves, they were called Rasena. We don't really know what this means. It's just what they called themselves. The sources of historical evidence which has survived comes how others view them. What we know about how they viewed themselves comes mainly through their art, and they left a stunning array of artifacts for us to look at here. The Etrurians were a native European people from perhaps before the Indo-European migrations. They spoke a non-Indo-European language, completely unrelated to the other peoples of the Italian peninsula, like the Latins, the Oscans, and the Gauls and Ligurians for the north, speaking Celtic languages, or the Greeks, which colonized much of southern Italy. You do get this isolate from the Greek island of Lemnos, which appears to have been perhaps even the same language or a dialect of it. And you get peoples further north in the Alps, which did speak a language related to Etrurian, but hardly anything of those two survived compared to Etrurian itself, which we have over 13,000 inscriptions for. I'll get to their language in the next video. Let's talk about who they were in this video. The writing which we have and the art from the Etruscan civilization covers a 700 year period and a bit more on either side. So I'm just going to go and break this down into set periods so you know exactly which areas of history that we're talking about. Early in the seventh century, the Etruscans had learned writing from the Greeks at Cume, the settlement that they had placed on the shore of Southern Italy, the island of Ischia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But here it is. So jumping into it, in the seventh century, the Etrurians, they began to coalesce into emerging cities. It was still very agricultural, of course, but something began to change. You had the Greeks coming up from the south, but these were not peripheral imitators on the fringes of civilization. The Etrurians were considered like the Latins and the Greeks and the Carthaginians as major players who could have easily become the, the dominant power instead of Rome. All these different groups, the Oscans, the Gauls to the north, were competing in terms of aesthetic art and this new form, this new technology, this alphabet which came in. It was the Etruscans who learned from the Greeks, who then taught the Romans. They probably had books of history, but none of those have come down to us. What we have are inscriptions, and most of all, they're frescoes, ornate, colorful, depicting ordinary bits of their life, festivals, marriages, funerals, and this rich wealth of ceramic pottery and engravings, jewelry, little earrings with images of goddesses on them. In some cases there's writing, etchings in gold, bronze, silver. These people were materially wealthy. We have mirrors or holdings that had mirrors in them. Daily objects, especially things to do with the wealthy aristocracy. The women passed on a lot of vestals that would hold uh, perfume or powder. 
and they had ornate etchings around them. This is not a civilization which is without its refinement. They were taking Greek customs and innovating them into their own styles. The seventh century is known as the Orientalizing period, looking toward the Orient, which at that time was the Greek world dominating that portion of the Mediterranean. And art was coming out of that region into present day Italy. And the Etrurians were absorbing that, learning how to make new kinds of pottery, especially with the colors of red and black in ceramics. In this orientalizing period, you get terracotta emerging. Art really accelerates in terms of not just quantity, but the quality of it produced. It's often rivaling that of Greece. This is no small player here in the Mediterranean. They're competing on a world stage at this point. This alphabet and this artistic fusion of the Greek influence with Etruscan created new styles because the Etruscans were also influenced by peoples to the north, like the Gauls and the Celts. And these were subtle influences and they had a shifting in terms of things like burials. They were cremating and they were burying people at the same time in different parts of Etruria. In the north, custom of cremation entered Etruria. But in the south, there was more the custom of burial. Over time, these intermingled and burial within painted, beautifully painted tombs became the norm. The earliest known tomb with paintings is the Tomb of the Ducks at Vey in the south. This was in the first half of the 7th century, and others were following this. Other Etruscan cities, like Surveti. By 600 BCE, the features of Etruscan civilization were well established. And the aristocratic families which controlled various city-states would have felt very comfortable in their position. But things around the Mediterranean were changing and they were changing fast. And the stability of Etruria was not going to last for very long. As the Etruscans expanded, there was something quite interesting that happened. Rome was never absorbed into this civilization. And there may have been an interesting reason why the Etruscans may not have seen them as a threat because of an Etruscan who became king of Rome, Lini and Plivy. Two sources, so that's interesting. And they tell of a man from Corinth in Greece who traveled to Tarquina, the Etruscan city-state, and his name was Demaratus. He fled Corinth in the middle of a political crisis in the middle of the seventh century and settled at Tarquina, which he knew from trading contracts. One of his sons was called Lucumo by Roman historians. He married a noblewoman of Tarquina named Tanaquil. Since, since they could not advance themselves because of his father's birth, they moved to Rome, and Livy tells us of when they were approaching Rome, an eagle came down. An eagle came down from the sky and plucked Lucumo's cap from his head, then rose to the sky and put the cap back on his head again. A woman skilled in celestial prodigies, this is quite a common trend in the Etrurian folklore, told them that he was destined to greatness because of this eagle having come down, and he eventually rose to become king of Rome. And this bought the neutrality of Rome in terms of matters with the Etruscans, so they didn't attack Rome. Maybe they thought this was a mistake later on. But what this story also tells us is that people were forced to leave Etruscan territories to go to Rome because of the conservatism of the Etruscan ruling class regarding immigrants. At the height of Etrurian expansion, you had settlements in Corsica and far to the south in Campania. Both of these were threatened by Greeks. The Greeks also fought the Carthaginians who were allies of the Etruscans. In 535, the Greeks met the combined Carthaginians and Etrurians off the coast of Corsica. 
Though the Greeks won a narrow victory, which was devastating for the Etrurians long term, they lost so many ships, they had to back out of the Tyrrhenian Sea area for a bit. However, the Etrurians never regained their confidence at sea. Another loss came at land. In 524 BCE, the Etruscans, sensing the threat from the Greeks, attempted to take Kuma with an army of half a million men, according to legend. But their general was killed in battle. Shortly afterwards, the Etruscans suffered another serious reverse when the last Etruscan king of Rome was expelled from the city and the Roman Republic was established. So the Romans became suspicious of Etruscan culture and expelled this aristocratic sense of doing things in favor of a republic, which meant that the Etruscans couldn't depend upon Rome to be neutral anymore. The Etrurian peoples were on the other hand very individualistic. They didn't do this collectivization of statehood like Rome did. They had different sensibilities and the Roman way of doing things was just more conducive to organizing an army. These people are still having influence across the Mediterranean in 500 BCE. Look at this tomb of the ogres from Tarquina and you can see they were a society their, their paintings had multiple elements of hierarchy and social structure within them. By the end of the Archaic period, the Etruscans had reached the zenith of their power and were facing new foes at sea and on land. Across the Mediterranean at the beginning of the Classical period, the Greeks had successfully defeated the Persians and thrown off this great threat, saving their civilization. They were keenly aware that they were almost snuffed out and their colonies further west were aware that they could be eliminated and they began an expansive way of looking at life. And they saw the Etruscans as more of a threat than they had before. In 474 BCE, the Greeks defeated the Etruscans at sea off Kuma, which was a major reversal of fortunes for the Etruscans. Gauls encroached from the north around the river Po. Expanding Celtic influence did remove some settlements of Etrurians in the far north. But by far the main adversary which would arise was Rome. You had the Siege of Ve, which lasted over 10 years. Eventually, the Romans, although they had expanded southward, turned northward. And in 435 BCE, they took Fidane, an Etruscan city, on the outskirts of Etruria proper. This probably should have sent alarm bells ringing, but it didn't unify them. And in 396 BCE, the city of Ve fell. That 10 year siege must have been enormous. And Ve was a cultural center. It was a center of many aristocratic art for the entire Etruscan civilization. This would have been a significant loss. And from this point, one by one, gradually over a century, the Etruscan city-states fall. One might ask, if Etruria was so wealthy and had all this art and already history going for it, how could a small single city like Rome defeat all these city-states? The answer lies in their social hierarchy and how they viewed themselves. They were not a unified people. Each city was ruled by a, an aristocratic family, whereas Rome you were a citizen within a larger state. So that when these two armies come against each other, Rome was just fighting a single city, but each Etruscan city was fighting an entire state of citizens, which came from different Latin speaking cities at that point, not just Rome. And so the Etruscans were a much more conservative people. They didn't want to incorporate newcomers into their culture, whereas Rome, brought immigrants in and made them Roman citizens, therefore not just increasing their numbers, but Romans were more socially aspirational, upwardly mobile in terms of economic status. 
in Etruscan society, you could be freed as a slave, but you weren't going to go much above your position if you weren't currying favor from these aristocratic families which controlled each single city-state. And so often what happened is people left Etruria and went to Rome to increase and better their position. And they brought their art with them. The previously strong individual character of Etruscan art became less marked towards the end of the classical era. This was not quite because of Rome yet. It was because Alexander the Great had flung his empire so far in the East that Greek civilization was imitated everywhere. Greek, everything was in vogue. And Etrurian art distinctly changes from this point, and it in turn influences the emerging Romans. The Etruscans form an alliance with the Celtic Gauls in 283 to fight the Romans, but they are defeated. They did too little too late. However, their legacy of art is really transmitted to Rome. Their paintings, Rome takes this and expresses it in its own right. Artists are teaching Romans how to do things. They're teaching, well, they had taught them how to write in the first place. Roman traditions, symbols of imperial power, are taken from the Etrurians, and these symbols of Roman power are emulated across the centuries, millennia after Rome. So Etruscans really give the Western world an inheritance through managing to pass on morsels of their own culture into Rome itself which we've emulated ever since. However, they were so enveloped and so absorbed by the Romans, it's difficult to actually discern which cultural elements are which culture. By about 280 BCE, all the Etruscan city-states had become client states of Rome, basically vassals required to do Rome's bidding on certain occasions, like serving in the Roman army. And the Romans placed colonies of people who spoke Latin, and the magistrates were Latin speaking, so social mobility became Latinized. And you have art, like this orator statue, which is Latin in appearance in every way. But there's Etruscan writing at the bottom, so Etruscan was a vernacular, but images of propaganda were being Latinized. The last uprising against Roman rule was a social uprising, probably slaves, around Orvieto in the year 264 BCE. After this period, even when enemies invaded into the Roman regions of the Italian peninsula, Etruscans did not fight against the Romans. They did not see people as liberators. They aspired to become Roman citizens and they'd never sided against the Romans after this point. They were distinctly loyal, but their art conveyed a sense of having another cultural identity that was not Latin. By the first century, Etruscan art had merged with Roman art, but memories of the language and culture lingered on, and people referenced back to people who were Etruscan or ideas of their own identity as being separate. And this left a lasting imprint even into the Renaissance. You had artists talking about Etruscan values in aesthetic. I would like to note a bit on their religion here because it made them very distinct as a nation apart from the Latins. They were known around the Mediterranean, the Etruscans, as being a uniquely religious people with their own gods, beliefs, prophecies, and soothsayers. So it's worth mentioning this because, especially in antiquity, made a people much more defined as being a people. I hope you saw in this video that the Roman world or the antiquity world had things in it that were not just Roman or Greek, that it was a collective theater of different peoples interacting with each other, influencing each other, and that many of them, like the Etruscans, 
are an integral part of what form the, the bedrock of Western civilization. And it's important we know about them to understand our own culture and where we come from and where Western civilization can go from here. Hey, Dio Chimor Amelia, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.